It's always appropriate, always wonderful, to sing about how great our God is. A magnificent God. Not like the gods of the pagans who are limited, who are petty, who are stupid and often outwitted by men. We have a great God. And he is worthy to be praised. Let's join together in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you that you are a great God. How great thou art. Our soul sings that song, a song of praise to you, the infinite, majestic, holy, and loving God. Fill us always with worship and adoration, with joy and gladness when we come into your presence. As we are here gathered together now to worship you, to praise you, to listen to your word. Speak to us by your spirit. Take the word of God and apply it. Reach into our hearts and if there be any wicked way, cleanse it by the washing of the water of the word. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Over the last two weeks together, we've been talking about good news, your home, and your friends. And last week, we noted some of the dangers in home evangelism. Uh, as we are sharing the gospel, we recognize that out there in many homes in our communities and surrounding us, there are cultists who are also sharing their pseudo-gospel. They know there's a secret power in home evangelization. We talked about the Jehovah's Witnesses wanting to do home Bible studies. We talked about Mormons famous for their family devotions and trying to get their children to bring their friends into their home. We talked about the warning in 2 Timothy 3 about those who creep into houses who have a form of godliness but denying the power thereof and we are commanded from such turn away. We learned that our home is a divine resource. It is not a personal possession. We saw many, many instances of illustrations in the New Testament where the home was used as a basis for evangelism, for discipleship, and for doctrinal training. We saw that hospitality was one of the very first marks of the early church where they broke bread from house to house, beginning as early as Acts chapter 2, which is the chapter that deals with the day of Pentecost and the start of the church. We saw that hospitality can be abused by carnal Christians. And that probably was picked up by ladies who at the very beginning were enjoying this house-to-house -house fellowship as the church met from house-to-house. -house. But then they picked up a bad habit of abusing that and being busybodies and tattlers and idle and wandering from house-to-house. -house. We saw that the early church was active in home evangelism and discipleship. We saw that Saul, before his conversion, realized the foundational nature of homes of the believers. We saw that Saul himself was saved and baptized in a house. We saw God called Cornelius in his own house and opened the gospel to the Gentiles in his own. We saw that most of the early churches met in homes rather than in church buildings, both for worship and for prayer. And we saw multiple instances of that in the New Testament. We saw that one of the first reactions of new believers in the New Testament was to open their homes to hospitality for other Christians. We saw that Paul evangelized the Philippian jailer in his own home. We saw the jailer immediately exercised hospitality to Paul and Silas in his own home, even though Paul was technically a prisoner. We saw other pagans who exercised hospitality to Christians and ended up getting saved, <coughs> carrying the gospel into other people's homes. Publius, for example, on Malta. We saw that being a single man or an old man is not an excuse for exercising hospitality. You remember Manasin, and that was the old disciple with whom they should lodge. We saw that Paul went house to house to spread the gospel, to evangelize, to disciple and teach, and not for the purpose of making money. He says in his speech to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. To house. 
Philip was a church leader and evangelist who exercised hospitality as required in the scripture. Paul even used his own rented house as a place for evangelism and discipleship. Acts 28.30, Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him. We talked about how Christ is our example, though he had no earthly house, yet he has made us his house. Certainly he wants to do evangelism in his house too, using us and the resources that he has given to us. We saw why God prohibits us from allowing false teachers into our homes or wishing them well in 2 John chapter 1, verses 7 through 11. And we concluded with, it should be evident that God not only permits, but expects and commands you and me to open our homes for evangelism, discipleship, worship, prayer, and Bible study, because our homes don't belong to us. Our homes belong to him. And we ask the question, what will we do about it? Now that brings us to tonight, verses 28 and following. Peter has given his little introductory speech to Cornelius, raised him from the ground. They've gone in, they've found the people sitting around inside the house. And now Peter begins to preach. He said unto them, Ye know how that it is unlawful for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come unto one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying as soon as I was sent for. I ask, therefore, for what intent ye have sent for me? And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send, therefore, to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon, a tanner by the seaside who, when he cometh, will, shall speak unto thee. Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, and thou hast well done, that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Very important phrase to remember. God hasn't told us to say all the things that we would like to say, to babble at the mouth, to run as though our mind were not in gear, but our, our mouth was in fourth gear. All the things that God has commanded you to say. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word, I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. He's saying that they have heard some of this before. They had not responded when they heard it before. Don't assume that just because somebody out there may have heard the gospel before, that they don't need to hear it again. Peter says they had heard it before. You know it. It was published throughout all Judea. It began at Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed, and that would bring us back to our sermon this morning, Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all these things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. But God raised him up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses, chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, Whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. 
While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. I wonder if after this event, Cornelius wished he had invited more people to hear the word. It fell not only on a few of them, or on a select number of them, or on the majority of them. The Holy Spirit fell on all them that heard the word. Oh, that God might pour out that kind of a blessing today. That all who hear the word would be saved. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. You remember, as we began this chapter, we pointed out that God always makes sure that there are witnesses present so that he will be glorified and that nothing can be done that is not certified by God himself. Those who left with Peter from Joppa, from Simon's house, probably went along as bodyguards. We talked about that earlier. They knew what was going on in the land of Israel, how persecution had arisen. They knew who people were that had been arrested and put in prison, and some of them had been killed. And Peter was a key man. They went along. There was a soldier and two servants. They probably figured, we need to be there in case somebody tries to take Peter out. But God had a different reason for them going. They saw what happened. They had been around on the day of Pentecost and seen what had happened to the Jews. And now they see something happening in the house of a Gentile. A Roman at that. They can't believe it. It says they're astounded. They're astonished. They of the circumcision who, which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. It's interesting. The Apostle Paul tells us the Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. You see, we have a group of Jews here. They're believing Jews, but they're still Jews. And the Jews require a sign, certainly something big enough to completely revolutionize their thinking. Peter had had his vision up on the roof. He had heard God command him directly out of heaven. He had heard the Lord Jesus he recognized the voice. Remember, we talked about that. But the others had been down fixing lunch. The others perhaps had come in the next morning when they heard that there were Gentiles at Simon's house and wondered, is this going to be some kind of a dirty play going on here? Peter had already been changed. That's why he went. But the others hadn't. You see, God works in each of our lives in a different way. But his ultimate goal is to change us so that we see things from his perspective. See things like he wants us to see them. And now we find Peter speaking. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we. Peter brings it to its full conclusion. What happened on the day of Pentecost? Yes, Peter and the other apostles spoke in foreign languages. Eighteen are mentioned in the text there. We find a gigantic number of people, Jewish men, being saved 
and then being baptized. They might have said, okay, the Holy Ghost has come to them, but they don't get to be baptized. They don't get to be part of this same body. Peter ties the knot. He says, what in the world should stand in the way of that? Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. This was not a hit and run evangelistic crusade. Peter spent some time there making disciples. Peter spent some time there teaching them the word of God. Did Peter say, now look guys, you got to take time off work because I'm going to be here for a while and you got to stay here. Or did they ask him? You see, a person who has truly trusted Christ is going to have a hunger and a thirst for the word of God. To them, that is the sine qua non. That is the most important thing. Without that, there is nothing. They prayed him to tarry certain days. They begged him, please stay with us. There's so much we have to learn here. Since our stewardship, in this case, is a home that belongs to God, and it needs to be used in the manner that he commands and for no other purpose, let me first begin by giving you a few summary verses on that as we then go through the text. Here are some summary verses. Luke 12, 42, the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward? How we use our home will determine our faithfulness and will determine our wisdom. Whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season. The Lord is the one who makes you ruler over a household. And as such, you have a responsibility for giving a portion of meat in due season. As you well know, that merely deals with just physical food alone, right? I think not. You and I have been given the food of the word of God. We have a responsibility not merely in relation to physical food, but in relation to spiritual food too. Four chapters later, Jesus says these words. He called him, speaking of the master and the servant, the master calling the servant, and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. Now we had briefly touched on that concept last week about how God can at any time take away a stewardship from us. He can take away our homes. He can take away the things that we own, which we so much think we need, and which clutter our lives. We will have to give an account for our stewardship. Let me read just briefly from Titus chapter 1. For a bishop then must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. 1 Peter chapter 4. Verses 9 and 10, use hospitality one to another without grudging. It makes our hackles stand up sometimes when we have a home invasion. Not just of termites, but there's a knock at the door, the doorbell rings, and there's somebody standing at the door that we wish rather weren't there. Without grudging. As every man hath received the gift. What was your context? 
hospitality. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Now, as we look at our text for tonight, we learn several things immediately. And you can tell this out of the very first verse that I read tonight. Hospitality, either given or received, is initially a scary thing to do. Hospitality, either given or received, is initially something that is out of the ordinary. Hospitality, in some contexts, can be illegal. Peter says that here in this context. In fact, you may be aware of the fact that many court cases handled by the Alliance Defending Freedom are of this nature, where city governments come down hard on home Bible studies and on home churches. In fact, cases like this have fallen on both sides of the fence. Sometimes the city loses and sometimes the city wins. And so that home Bible study can no longer be there. But here in the book of Acts, it's not just human law, it was divine law. Peter said unto them, you know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come in unto one of another nation. Divine law. And yet there's Peter standing in a Gentile house. That brings us to the second thing that we learn out of this text is that God can change the rules any time he wishes to do so. And he can require us something that he never required before. In fact, he may require us to do something that he might have in the past prohibited. Here's an illustration of it. Something that God had prohibited the Jews from doing, and now he has commanded Peter to do it. Look at chapter 10, verse 28, the second half of the verse. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. God can change the rules any time he wishes. And Peter responded, verse 29, Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying. <laughs> now he had gainsayed right at the beginning of that vision, if you remember. Uh, gainsay means to speak against. What were the first words out of Peter's mouth when he saw the sheet and the Lord said to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. The first words out of his mouth were, Not so, Lord, for nothing unclean has ever <laughs> touched my lips. Nothing has ever gone in my mouth that is ritually unclean. But when they showed up downstairs and Peter was told by the Holy Spirit to go down, He'd meditated just a moment on what this would mean. The Holy Spirit said, go down, greet them, meet them, go. Peter responded the way we are supposed to respond. Not like Peter first responded, but like he responded when he went with them. He brought them in overnight, which is a defilement of a Jewish home. He went with them to a Gentile home and entered in, which is a defilement of a Jewish person. God changes the rules when he wishes to do so. And it's rather interesting that Peter wasn't told that he had to have a good reason for going. He wasn't told to apply some of the tests that we're required to apply to keep apostates and heretics out of our houses. Folks, we need to get used to it when God establishes the parameters that he wants to establish. You know, if you don't flex with the commands of God, you will very soon find yourself being pulled back under all the Levitical laws of the Old Testament. Very sadly, there are some Jewish Christians today in particular who are very seriously tempted in this area. In fact, there's an illustration of it in the New Testament. Paul later mentions it in the book of Galatians, which was written to avoid just such types of heresies. Galatians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. But when Peter came to Antioch, I withstood him to the faith, 
face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. Now remember, this is Peter. Peter the one who got the vision. Peter the one who did eat with the Gentiles, both there in Joppa and probably there also in, uh, up in Caesarea because he was there a few days. Before all of that, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they, that is these people who came from James. James was the head pastor in the church in Jerusalem. And we're going to see more about that when we get to chapter 15 and what's been called the Jerusalem Council. But here Paul's giving us a summary. Because James is in charge of that council. So Peter is up there in Antioch. He's been in Caesarea. Now he's gone to Antioch. James sends the people looking for Peter. He did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, these men from James, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. How easily we are people pleasers. How easily we care more about what people think of us than what God thinks of us. Have you ever felt peer pressure? I certainly have. All my life, there's always the pressure to conform. There's always the pressure to just fit in and don't be different. <laughs> I feel it in the presbytery. Why do I have to be a weirdo like I am? I feel it among family members. I feel it with people that I'm trying to impress. By the way, a foolish thing to do. Peter crumbled at one point. He crumbled in Antioch, and I think it was for a reason. God had a reason even in that. And Paul explains it. It says, And other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Barnabas, a fantastic Christian, the one who brought Paul and introduced him to the church in Jerusalem when all the believers were hiding from Paul. There was a reason even for Barnabas to fall away like this because God was setting an example not to follow. Years ago, I may have shared this with you, I was driving along and I pulled up to a stoplight and sitting next to me on a big Harley Davidson chopper was uh, somebody who was a, uh, <laughs> well, one of those kind of guys, you know, probably from my generation because he had a gray beard and a long ponytail back down the back and uh, one of those Nazi kind of shaped helmets on his head. And uh, the back of his shirt said, I, I'm not a bad example. I'm a good example of what your mother told you to avoid. <laughs> well, that's why we have the situation with Peter and Barnabas. And Paul goes on there in Galatians to talk about how he bawled Peter out publicly for doing what he had done. It's a warning to us also. We can be walking along the right way. We can be doing the right thing. We can be re immediately responsive when God calls us to do something. But then there will come a social situation in which we are pressured. Young people face that in many different areas. For example, they'll be out with a group of their friends and one of their friends will break out a pack of cigarettes. And light it up and look oh so cool and then he'll say to the friends come on try it one cigarette won't hurt you and a few of the others may have tried it before and so they pick one up and pretty soon 
that Christian young person who does not want to defile his body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit, looks real embarrassed and real ashamed, and pretty soon that pressure is big. Oh, come on, you chicken, you coward. What's the matter with you? Don't you want to be part of the group? And he wants very much to be part of the group. Or they have the pressure where their friends are talking about all the different people they've had immoral relations with. And they're going around the circle giving their stories. And the Christian girl is sitting there and she's beginning to blush and she's lowering her eyes and somebody picks up on it and says, Hey, so-and-so, tell us your story. Oh, come on. Hey, I'll set you up with a date. All those pressures, Satan knows how to use them. And if somebody like Peter fell on an issue that was so clearly revealed to him as this, you and I can easily fall if we are not walking in the Spirit and walking by faith. A group of Christian young people getting together. They're arguing about whether or not alcohol is okay in the Bible. And one of them begins to wax eloquent on Jesus turned the water into wine. By the way, if you figure it out, it's over 160 gallons of booze that Jesus made if that was alcoholic beverage. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is deceiving, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. And they begin to argue that. And then they begin to argue, well, it's a little bit is okay. And why can't we social drink? And after all, it, it's good for you because, you know, the, the dark wine, the red wine, actually has antioxidants in it. <laughs> and it has certain very important effects to help your heart. And they go on and on and on and sound pseudoscientific as to why this is certainly okay. Oh, come on, just take a sip. Just taste it. And the Christian young person tries it and ends up an alcoholic. Or, as the Bible calls it, a drunkard. Peter had a weak spot. It had been one of his strongest spots. He had stood firmly for the Mosaic law of what you can eat and what you cannot eat. God gave him new revelation. Peter responded properly, but that thing was still lurking in the back of his mind. Satan loves to attack us and beat us where we think we're the strongest. Some practical lessons that we can learn out of this. The other Jews dissembled likewise with him. He set an example. He was a leader. That's why the devil likes to attack leaders. Because you see, if he can get the leader, the sheep will be scattered or the sheep will follow the leader down the same sinful path. Insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. By the way, the word translated dissimulation there is the Greek word hypocrites. It's the word we get hypocrite from. Barnabas also was carried away with their hypocrisy. You know, that's the opposite of what it means to truly love the brethren. Paul uses that same word in the negative in Romans 12.9. Let love be without dissimulation, <clears throat> without hypocrisy. You all know the people with the plastic faces, right? When you talk to them, they seem oh so friendly and they're just oh so nice to you. But you know that the minute you turn your back, they're going to put a knife in it. They're going to talk to other people about you. Let love be without dissimulation. 
Genuine love of other Christians is not hypocritical. We saw some of that this morning when we were talking about the anointing of the Holy Spirit and what it accomplishes in the life of the believer. So now let's go back. Remember, the book of Acts records for us the historical change from the law of Moses to the grace of Christ. That's the point of Peter's earlier vision in Acts chapter 10, that we're not under the law, we are under grace. We are no longer bound by the law as our disciplinarian, but we are empowered and motivated by our love for Christ and by the Spirit of God. It's so easy for us because we, in our circles, understand that the law does have some strength, but not the strength of grace. The law is good if it's used for the right reasons, and Paul explains that to us. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. That's agape, that's love, that's what we're talking about. Out of good conscience, that's what comes when you have your sins forgiven. And of faith unfeigned, that is non-hypocritical faith. It's not faked, it's unfeigned. That means it's not make-believe. From which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. Now here is a key verse. 1 Timothy 1.8. We just have to be careful about it. Because we tend to use the law in the wrong way. Paul says, we know that the law is good. It is good. The law is not wicked. The law is not evil. You don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. The law is good, next phrase, if a man use it lawfully. In other words, there is a correct way to use the law, and there is a deadly wrong way to use the law. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. Now, at the moment you trusted Christ as your Savior, you became righteous in the sight of God. You didn't have to follow the law to get saved. You don't have to follow the law to get sanctified. You don't have to obey the law for your empowerment for daily Christian living. You were placed in Christ and you were justified. You were declared righteous by a righteous God. That's what justification is all about. You also had imputation take hold at that very precise moment. Imputation is how you were made righteous. Justification is the declaration of righteousness. If God says so, it's true. Imputation is the reason that God can declare you righteous. Imputation is a bookkeeping term in the Greek which deals with transactions whereby certain ledger balances are transferred from one account to another account. Where debits are translated, transferred to a credit account and where credits are transferred to a debit account. Imputation is where Christ took your sins upon himself, your debt, transferred to his account. And where his righteousness was transferred to your account. The heart of the Reformation centers around those two doctrines. Justification and imputation. The just shall live by faith. The law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous 
man. Now we pause for a caveat, for a parenthesis at this point. And the parenthesis is this, that we are not yet glorified. So though we are seen in Christ and we are empowered by the Spirit of God to do that which is righteous, we still have an old sin nature and we still sin. And when that happens, the righteousness of God stands against us. The law does declare his righteousness. And we're told what the law is made for. The law is made for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers. Some Christian man goes out and goes to a prostitute. Yeah. The law is made for whoremongers. He's still seen in Christ, but he has some discipline coming. For them that defile themselves with mankind, that's the sodomites. For men stealers, kidnappers, for liars, ooh, suddenly he's listed one of the things that all of us fall into that category, don't we? For perjured persons, those who lie under oath. But listen to this last catch-all phrase. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Do you understand why you need to study the word of God? Why you need to be taught by the Holy Spirit through his anointing as we spoke this morning? Why you need to walk by faith? Why you need to walk in the spirit? Why you need to bring the flesh into subjection? Now, let's examine, let's examine me. One of the key areas. We're going back now. <laughs> Moving off that discussion about how because Peter fell back under the law, he violated some of the principles that God had told him back in Acts chapter 10. So let's examine me. One of the key areas in which hospitality must be applied is in the home of elders and pastor teachers. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality. That's a word that means to be addicted to it. Apt to teach. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. And then he goes ahead and talks about the deacons in verse 8. And then in Titus 1.7, which we read a moment ago as we saw hospitality as a stewardship, a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God. We find Peter speaking of it. Also, that it is a stewardship and it is to be done because it is the right thing, feeding the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Now, there are some very good reasons for this mandatory requirement for a pastor, like the guy that's standing and talking to you right now, and elders. Here are some of the reasons. Number one, it makes sure that the pastor and elders are not practicing the hypocrisy. Remember we talked about how Peter had dissimulated? That's the word that means hypocrisy. That they're not practicing the hypocrisy of do as I say and not as I do. Notice something. This command concerning given to hospitality is immediately after of good behavior. You see, hospitality... <laughs> reveals some inner workings. Secondly, it makes sure that the visitors can see that the pastor and elders are in their natural setting, that which is normally hidden away from the rest of the church. Third, it makes sure the pastors and elders are setting an example of obedience to the commands of Christ. Fourth, it makes sure that the pastor and elders don't consider their home as a possession 
rather than as a stewardship. We just read it, that they have to be blameless as the stewards of God. Fifth, it makes sure that the pastor and elders have cleansed their home of evil artifacts. Oh, I could tell you incredible stories of having gone into homes and finding there, even homes of church leaders, things that invited demonic influence into those homes. Oh, you say, those weren't too bad, things like a little ceramic Buddha. It's, after all, just decorative sitting over in a corner someplace. Oh, it's not too bad to have that particular woman's magazine in here. Now, I know the cover. We probably should turn that one over because of the things that it's telling you about, how you can have this really hot sex life and all of that. Dear people, not just for Christian leaders, all of us need to cleanse our homes. I know of one situation where a missionary to Navajo Indians was traveling around the country and carrying with him various things that he had gotten from a witch doctor who got saved. He hadn't burned them, hadn't even buried them or thrown them in the river. No, he used them on his display table. And he carried those things with him everywhere he went. And when he contacted us, he was going to come to our church. That was many years ago, back up in North Jersey. Uh, he wanted to set up his display table. And when I heard what he had, I said, you can't bring those in the church building. You know, it's an interesting, this man, and we talked about it for some time, he suffered from some very serious health problems. And he came under conviction about this and got rid of those things. And you know what? His health problems cleared up. Are there things in your home that invite the devil and the flesh to have a prominent place? It makes sure the pastor and elders are setting the example of obedience to Christ. It makes sure that they are cleansing their homes so that they are not having evil artifacts that attract evil spirits. It puts the pastor and the elders on the same level as their guests in a non-formal, non-threatening setting so that the word of God can be communicated easily and freely, whether for Bible study or prayer or fellowship or worship. It lets the church see the family of the pastor and the elders in their natural setting, not merely in their best behavior setting. It lets the church see if the pastor and elders are really fulfilling all of the rest of the requirements or if they are covering up things that would be revealed and things that would show they don't meet other requirements as well. Notice that this requirement is listed directly before the requirement apt to teach. It's right in the middle of this list, but it's right after of good behavior and right before apt to teach. You see, hospitality is a form of and a venue for teaching. It shows the rest of the church effective methods of hospitality, illustrations of hospitality, how to effectuate hospitality so that other believers can imitate the example. So this is certainly a, an area where you can hold my feet to the fire and the feet of your elders to the fire as well. All of us as church leaders need to open our homes to other believers as examples to you as a congregation with, of course, the same restrictions and obligations that we've already discussed as to who you can't open your home to. I'm personally very thankful that while I was in China, just recently, for three weeks, Judy housed and fed five different people in our home, some of them for an extended period of time. I'm thankful that the ladies are willing to come each month for their missionary prayer and letter reading at the manse. I'm thankful that many of you were willing to come on Wednesday evening during the prayer sessions that we held at the manse when we had a series on those amazing events that have occurred in the state of modern Israel with our prayer time following afterwards. Just preparing this message reminds me that I need to do more of this. 
You see, I've got to be willing to do what I preach to you. And this is clearly what the scripture teaches. The third thing that we learn in our text tonight is that God has a right to choose whom he will. Verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. I think it was kind of surprising to Peter when he heard that God had actually sent an angel to talk to Cornelius. Now Cornelius knew it. Perhaps the soldier knew it. Perhaps the two servants knew it. But in any case, Cornelius tells Peter again because Peter says, why did you call for me? And so Cornelius gives him the direct story and Peter says, that's astounding. You mean God would send an angel to talk to a Roman centurion? <laughs> God chooses people that we wouldn't choose. God reaches down into Camden, for example, and saves some people that you and I probably wouldn't want to walk on the same street with. God calls people who perhaps have personally opposed us in something we wanted to do, or perhaps even opposed the gospel. You know, I pray for certain people in our town administration here that God will open their hearts because they're lost and headed for hell, even though they have opposed this church and have done so in some cases for years. And as I learned the other day, have actually cost this church a great deal of money, thousands of dollars years before I came here. God chooses people that we would rather see die and go to hell. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. The next lesson that we learn is that a man or a woman, if they follow the light that they have, God will give them more light. Look at verse 35. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. All of the goyim who followed the light that they had. By the way, that runs into a question that you frequently run into. But what about the heathen who have never heard? I run into that over and over. I used to run into it a lot more in high school and college uh, than I do nowadays. But I mean, that certainly is something that young people will be challenged with when they try to witness to somebody. You know, because that gets the spotlight off the person that you're talking to. Well, yeah, but God isn't really there. He's not really fair because, you know, think about all the millions and millions and millions of people who have lived on earth and how many of them are now in hell, if you're, what you're telling me is true. And think about how they were in these places, you know, in some deep, dark jungle in Africa. And they were there for, say, 15 years, and then a tiger, or a lion, not a tiger in Africa, but a lion ate them. What about them? You know the Bible has an answer for that. In fact, what we need to point out is a verse like this. People who respond to the initial light that God gives, you know, God will move heaven and earth to send them a missionary. That's what God did with Peter, taking him to Cornelius. If a person follows the light that God has given them, and Paul says that all men have at least two lights that God has given to them, Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, Paul tells us that the heathen have the light of creation. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Now, what does the next phrase say? So that they are without excuse. In other words, it's not enough light to save them, it's enough light to condemn them. But they can know something about his eternal power and his Godhead. 
the Trinity. Then we find Romans chapter 2. And in Romans chapter 2, we have the light of conscience. Men know there is a God, Romans 1, and that he is big. Romans chapter 2, men know the difference between right and wrong. They innately know that certain things are bad. Oh, dear friends, I wish all of you could hear all the things that we're talking about at the summer Bible school in the adult class. Recently I was reading, there's going to come out on August 7th, a new DVD. And the entire DVD is God versus Evolution. It's interviews with premier evolutionary scientists who are answering questions and they are admitting that they understand that the creation might point to a God but if they go that route then they would have to change their lifestyle they know something's wrong in their life they have a conscience that declares to them that they have sinned. And so they suppress the truth. They hold the truth, that's the word for suppress, the truth in unrighteousness. But when God calls his elect, he motivates them to follow the light that, he's been, that they've been given. Cornelius was a man who followed the light that he was given. And God moved heaven and earth. He changed the heart of a Jew to eat with a Gentile. So when someone says to you, well, what about the heathen who have never heard? The way that we need to respond to that is, well, you have heard. So, regardless of what God does with them, you know what God's going to do with you because you have heard. Bring the spotlight back to the one to whom you are witnessing. The next thing that we notice here in our passage is the content of the message. The only thing that God blesses with supernatural power is the proclamation of Christ. Notice, that takes up the bulk of the passage. That's almost all the verses in this entire passage. In fact, it takes up the bulk of almost every passage in the book of Acts where people trust in Christ. Now, what's the reason for taking up so much space over and over again in the same book? I mean, the reader already has heard this message before, right? The reason is because it is the most important message in the world. And because it fits every situation, and because it fits every person, and because it fits every culture, and because it fits every time in history, and it is simple enough for every Christian to proclaim without a degree in theology. It's a message that never gets old. It's a message that is always supernatural. It is a message that is always the steel cable that ties us back to the roots of our faith. Listen to it again. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all these things which he both did. He summarized the entire Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in that verse. We just passed over. And we are witnesses of all these things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. 
You know, that's the heart of the gospel. That's what Paul tells us is the gospel in Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the point you need to get to in every message or every talk that you have with someone who is lost. You're a sinner, you're lost. The message is Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and rose again. If you trust him, in him, you'll be saved. If you trust in him, you'll receive forgiveness of sins. Notice what happens here. They're preaching and it says, To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. And that's the point at which those people trusted Christ. How do we know they trusted Christ? They had heard the message before. It hadn't made much sense to them. They'd heard it over a period of time. That goes all the way back to the baptism of John. That's at least four years before this time. It's actually a little more than that, but at least four years. They've heard this thing before. They've heard it repeatedly. But it's preached this time, the Holy Spirit decides it's time for him to act. And at the point that they understand that believing on Christ gives them remission of sins, they trust in Christ. That's where we come to one of the evidences in the book of Acts that a new group has been included in the body of Christ. Verse 44, While Peter spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them, all them, which heard the word. On all them. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Now, we need to understand, and you've heard me preach on the issue of tongues before, this is not standard procedure today as proof of salvation. If that were the case, most everybody would not be saved. But it was a necessary sign for the Jews who required a sign that Gentiles were coming in to the body of Christ on an equal basis with the Jews who had come in on the day of Pentecost. And then we see at last, baptism followed salvation. We've already discussed all the different types and <clears throat> occurrences of baptism in the book of Acts. But notice the formula. Verse 47. Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Interesting. A different baptismal formula, and we've talked about that in detail, then we find in Matthew chapter 28, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. It says these were baptized in the name of the Lord, same as we saw over in Acts chapter 2. Well, there's so much here. But I hope that it gives us an illustration of how important it is for us to be obedient when God commands us to obey. And then we can expect the Spirit of God to work in a supernatural way through the resources that we obediently use in His service. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for the privilege of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that you will cause us to use the resources that you have entrusted to us as those things which are not our possessions, but your possessions. Things which are merely a stewardship that has been entrusted to our care. And then someday when the Lord calls us to give account for our stewardship, the talents that he's entrusted to us, we won't have to say as did the wicked steward, well, I took it, I wrapped it up, made sure that nobody touched it, kept it hidden where nobody would know except me where it was located. Here it is, it's yours. Father, take your word, bless our hearts with it, make us the witnesses that you want us to be, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn today is hymn number 344. Again, grace, the grace